Hello. <laughs> That's I mean, almost a little bit anticlimactic after all that music and the exciting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so hello, everybody who's watching. My name is Patricia Nilsson. I'm a reporter with the Financial Times. I cover the cannabis industry and I'm here with Boris Jordan, who is the chairman and founder of Cureleaf. Um, hello, Boris. How are you doing today? I'm very well, Patricia. Glad to be here. I hope you're well, too. Yeah, I am well. I'm well as well. It's kind of funny because it feels like you're joining me live in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not in the kitchen, but I'm in a home office, so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, so let's get started. We have a lot to talk about and not that much time. Um, and um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you today to kind of go with the theme of this whole session is, um, you know, Cura Leaf ob obviously uh, made this very interesting acquisition into into EMAC. Uh, you entered Europe. And so I wanted to ask, why Europe? Why now? Well, um, very similarly to the way we approach the U.S. market, we were early arrivals. Uh, we started buying companies um, across the United States uh, back in the in you know sort of 2014, 15, 16, uh, and onwards. Um, and the reason we did was we felt that um, you can't build either national or global brands unless you have the distribution capability and the manufacturing capability in those markets. And so. Um, I always feel that the cost of these businesses, at least in my 30 years of experience, go up as these industries grow and the cost starts to rise dramatically. And so getting in early really, really gives you one, a head start from the development and knowledge of the market, but two, it also gets you in early before the prices go up. And so, um, you know, we were able to enter Europe at less than 3% of our market cap, you know, 2.8% of our market cap. Um, and we were able to raise financing at the European level uh, in order to be able to finance the expansion of that business. And so we, you know, we de-risked it a little bit at the same time um, and we got in early. And so we're very, very excited about that. And, and we've put our flag into the European market. We're now learning that market um, as we build the business. And we really feel that the European market will be a contributor, you know, 22, 20, sorry, 23, 24, 25. Uh, and let's be honest, the European economy is, is, is bigger than the U.S. economy when you look at it as a whole. Um, uh, it, 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 it has its challenges um, uh, given the structure of the European Union, but it is a very large market. We estimate the cannabis market to be over $200 billion in Europe and the areas around Europe, if you include Israel, Morocco, and other countries, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, that are looking to legalize. And so we thought it was a very a big enough opportunity that we, it could not be ignored. And we want to be the largest player in the world. We are now, and we want to maintain that position. So we wanted to get into the European market. And and can you, you know, as you mentioned, the European market is quite quite big, quite diverse. And can you walk us through which markets in Europe are are you know in active phases of new uh, medical programs? I mean, do we have any, you know? Do we have any adult use programs? Where where do you potentially see that happening in the next few years? Sure. So we so uh, Europe is largely today a medical market. There is there there are some initiatives in both uh, Switzerland and in Holland uh, for adult use, but I'll address those later. Um, the the biggest markets in Europe, uh, and I'm going to include um, Israel in that, um, are the are Germany, UK, Israel, and Italy today, um, in terms of size. And, and those are still quite small markets. I mean, Germany is probably 200 million euros. Um, uh, you know, Israel is probably the biggest um, uh, out of those three, out of those four. But um, Spain is reviewing a program now. Um, Portugal has just approved a program. Um, um, and so um, we, we feel there's certainly CBD programs in places like um, uh, Poland and, and, and Italy. There's, a, there's, a, there's also a medical THC program. Um, uh, um, cannabis program in Italy that's uh, largely controlled by the, the military, actually, in Italy. But we feel that, like the United States, a lot of these countries will start to liberalize and expand these programs, and so they will start to grow. And we're seeing that in the UK, actually. We're seeing very, very strong month-on-month, -month, almost 40% growth in patient growth in the UK uh, on the cannabis side. And that really is starting to reflect a little bit of what the US looked like when we got started in you know, in 2016, 2017, with real markets there. So we're, we're excited about the progress that's being made. Yes, the Europeans are taking a more careful approach to this and a much more pharmaceutical medical approach than the United States did. 
Um, uh, but that's fine too, because we, we think that the, the, the R and D that's being done in order to provide these products is actually making these products safer. Um, and is giving a more knowledge base, not only for the consumer, but also for the regulators about how to build the industry around cannabis. And so we think it's, it's, it's an exciting market and, um, we're, we're more than pleased that we made the decision that we did. Um, you, you mentioned the UK. Um, obviously, I am in the UK. I talk to cannabis companies here on 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 almost a daily basis. And when you talk to cannabis companies here, they're actually um, you know they they complain quite a bit that the um, there's too much regulation and or not too much. I mean, it's the wrong type of regulation, and that it's just hampering the the rollout of of, of medical. And and some are arguing that you know, the UK's medical cannabis industry is a little bit under threat unless we see a new regulatory framework. Um, you know, do you share those thoughts or do you think that time will, will solve? So, so if you would ask uh, uh, most American companies, they would complain about the same thing. Um, the regulations are opaque. Uh, we can't even bank uh, in our own uh, country. We have to, you know, raise capital outside of the country. So there's there's lots of issues we we, we have to, uh, you know, in, in Europe, it's what I call a capital light model. We can build out our facilities in Portugal and Spain, and then we could distribute the product to Germany, to the UK. We can export words in the US in every single state. We have to grow, we have to manufacture, and we have to sell, and we cannot cross even state lines in the United States. So, so I think that, listen, there's a tremendous amount of stigma around cannabis. The facts are the facts. The facts are that cannabis has been used for medicinal reasons for over a thousand years. They found cannabis in, in Egyptian tombs. It was certainly used by American Indians. We know that. Um, and it was a, a stigma that was created. It's, it's a not, it's, a, it's a non, um, addictive product. It's, it's healthier to the human body, certainly than opiates and certainly than alcohol from a recreational perspective. Uh, and, and it was a stigma that was created by big business, particularly the alcohol companies and the pharmaceutical companies in the 1920s. And then again, in the 1970s, because it was a com competitive biological plant that you couldn't really control who grew it. And so they wanted to control these markets. And so they lobbied their way to get rid of cannabis. The fact is, is that, that you know, the science is on our side and I always believe that science wins. Um, and I am absolutely sure that we're going to see libera lib uh, uh, liberalization in all the European markets over time. It just takes time and one has to be able to play the long game, has to have the capital structure to play the long game. But you do get paid because what happens is, is that you get into the market and you really get to know it really well from the inside from early days. I mean, just the same way, you know, I've operated in emerging markets my whole career. And when I was very early on, I went to Russia in the early 1990s. And the reason we were successful there was because we were there early, way before any investors came to Russia, before there were any stock markets or anything like that. We started to, we actually wrote the laws for the first stock markets. We, we, we built the first uh, markets. And because we did that, we had a head start on everybody else when they arrived. And we did very well for that reason. It's the same thing in cannabis. We got in at the ground floor early on, a lot of frustration, a lot of difficult working with the regulators, but you have to have the patience the markets will come. And the reason they'll come is because just let's look at the illicit markets. The illicit market in the United States was over 100 billion. In Europe, it's over 100 billion as well. These are facts. And and, and so people are using cannabis today. And and and, and the, the smart strategy is to legalize it, tax it, and make it safe by regulating it rather than having people use illicit products. And I believe that's a trend that's taking place across the world. Um, in cannabis, and I think it's one that's going to take place in Europe as well. It's already taking place in Europe. As I said, you've got Switzerland and Holland looking at adult use programs um, in their countries. And once the first once the first country makes that step, it's going to be like a domino in Europe. It's just going to escalate very, very quickly. And so that's what we're really there for. We're there to be on the ground, to learn, to get to know the regulators, for them to get to know us, to learn how to work with them. And then we're going to start building our business on the back of it. Um, do you think we're going to see more um, North American companies come in and invest in Europe? Or do you think uh, the European market is going to be, you know, relatively independent or are they going to sort of I, I, I think I think that eventually they will come once the program is bigger. Um, um, a lot of the U.S. companies are capital constrained, but more importantly, because capital you can find, they don't know Europe very well. I mean, I spent my whole adult business career in Europe. 
um, whether it be in Eastern Europe first and then in Western Europe through my involvement in Telecity, uh, the data center business. Um, and so I worked at, in multiple countries in Europe. And so I, I feel a lot more comfortable. I lived there for, for 27 years. So um, I feel very comfortable in Europe. To me, As a matter of fact, to me, the United States, when I came back a few years ago, was more foreign actually than Europe because I built my whole adult career in, uh, in European markets. And so it was a logical progression for, for Cureleaf because one, we had the capital and two, we understood Europe. I understand Europe, I think a bit better than a lot of my colleagues. And I felt more comfortable making that entry into the European market, albeit early, but I felt a lot more comfortable that we could build the entry. And I knew from my experience that if you really want to build a robust business, you have to be in there early and learn the markets. You just can't arrive into Europe and say, hey, I'm this big American company. We're going to rule the roost here. That doesn't work in Europe, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very nationalistic place, not only from an EU perspective, but much more so on an individual country perspective. And you've got to play by European rules, not by American rules. And so that's why I'm here. That's why we kept the European management team in place, um, because you know we want to build it within the European framework rather than coming in as a you know an, an elephant in a china shop and try to teach people how to do it. That's very interesting. And and so um, you know, tell us why Emac? Why did you choose Emac? And and you know, and what is this? What's been going on there now when it transitions from Emac to uh, Cureleaf International? Well, for two reasons, we're actually the main reason we're actually going to keep um, Emac is going to be renamed Cureleaf International. Um, um, but we're going to keep um, the management team and the business completely ring fenced from the U.S. business. There's actually a legal reason for that too. Uh, uh, the, Euro the European business is totally legal within Europe, um, whereas the U.S. business is legal on a state by state basis, but has this quirkiness where it's still not legal on a federal basis. That could put the European business under threat um, with regulators. And so, what we did was we structured this deal from our holding company in Canada where it's absolutely legal, right? Federal, federally legal in Canada. So we, we, we bought the company from there and we capitalized the European subsidy with money out of Europe. So there is no money flow between the US companies and the European companies. So it's gonna be run as an independent company with its own board, its own management team in Europe run by Europeans. And you know I will be there like I am at Cureleaf um, as a founder, I'll be there on the board as chairman, you know, mentoring the team in the way we build it out. And of course, there will be some cross fertilization in R and D. There'll be some um, some some branding that will be done together and some marketing that will be done together. But we're not going to have any kind of financial integration um, mm -hmm. uh, from that perspective. And we're really going to run the business. I mean, Antonio is going to continue. Um, he's been he was the founder of Emac, and he's going to continue to be. He's very highly incentivized. Um, and he's going to stay as the CEO of that business and he's going to run that business in Europe separately. So that's the way we've decided to build it. And, and, and frankly, I think it's the right way. I think many American companies sometimes have made mistakes when they've gone abroad um, in, in trying to bring their business practices everywhere and it doesn't work. And, and since I actually started my career in Europe and, and well, spent the bulk of my career in Europe, I see it a little bit differently. And so I really want to build a European Cureleaf business, which may be a bit different than the Europe than the U.S. business. And and so w what's uh, you know the Cureleaf U.S. bringing to Cureleaf International? So you know I mean to the former Emac they've already operated in space they were doing a good job. You know what what can they learn from you or or how how well, is we, we brought we brought capital first of all our access to capital right I mean I I've been in the capital markets for thirty years. So, you know, I mean, EMAC had never had an investment the size of the one that, you know, we did right away. We did a $130 million placement, you know, uh, before we even closed the deal in order to finance um, the development of that business. So we brought that. We also bring a tremendous amount of, of, of knowledge because we've been doing this longer than they have, right? So the base business practices in cannabis, the knowledge of the plant, the science behind the plant, a lot of the R&D work, a lot of the products that we developed for the medical market in the United States, we can now share with EMAC um, or, or Cureleaf International in the European markets. And so I think we bring that as well. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think it was a, you know, they needed our branding, right? You know, we, we, we've we invested a tremendous amount in our branding, our packaging and things like that. So we bring a tremendous amount of knowledge to EMAC um, in the business, which they can lean on um, in building out the business. and. And, and they, of course, you know, from our perspective, bring us a footprint in Europe, which is something we really wanted to have. And, and 
And so that was that was the reasoning behind it. And again, it wasn't it wasn't it, our priority. Still continues to be the United States. There's no question. We see the growth there as exponential over the next few years. But as we my vision is as we see growth start to taper in the, in the United States, at least from these hyper levels that we're seeing now, I think there's going to be growth for a long period of time in the sector, but at least the hyper growth, we're going to start seeing that kind of growth in Europe. And so it fit really well in terms of my long-term plan for the development of the business um, that we get it into the European market. So as just as I think competition starts building in the U.S., I think you're going to start seeing the European market opening up, more countries going recreational, more countries building robust medical programs. And, and don't forget, Europe also gives us a landing spot for Egypt, which is considering this, Morocco, which is considering this, um, Asia, which is considering it. So it really acts as a hub for us um, in, in, in looking at the cannabis industry, not only in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And you mentioned this uh, 130 million um, investment. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? You know, why and who, um, you know, who are these people and, and well, what are they doing? Confidential, it's confidential. It's a very well-known, um, very large investor in Europe um, uh, who's invested a lot of, but we have a conference shout agreement. We're not to, allowed to disclose it, but that was their, their, their they, want, they wanted that, but it's a very large institutional player um, that's made investments in all different types of industries in Europe. Um, and uh, they they are big believers. They are investor in Cureleaf uh, proper as well. Um, uh, and so they really believe in the industry. They believe in what we're doing. And they've seen the success that we've had in the United States. And so, um, as a matter of fact, in many ways, they were pushing us uh, in Europe as well. Um, they approached us and said, you know, have you guys looked at Europe? And and um, we had known EMAC because I had a uh, uh, investment in EMAC through uh, a investment arm that I have, a very small investment, but I was I was an investor at EMAC. And so um, they said, you know, we, we would be very keen on the, backing you guys on a European venture. And so we, um, we kind of started looking at it more seriously because of that. And then when we did find a target eventually to acquire, uh, which we felt was a very good one because we liked Antonio, we liked his team, and we liked the way they built their business, um, we approached them and said, would you guys be interested in investing in the business? And they said, yes. And so that's how the transaction came about. Okay. Um, and can we, when we talk about Europe, can we get a bit more granular in terms of, you know, which countries are going to lead the way uh, when it comes to further regulation? And it would be great to kind of have the, you know, what, where is CBD interesting and where is, you know, medical and, and what are we seeing in adult use? So CBD is pretty widespread, to be honest, through all of Europe. So I, I, they, uh, almost every country in, in, in Europe now allows CBD, right, with very low levels of THC, um, negligible levels of THC. So you can, you can, there are shops all over Italy, there are shops everywhere. You can buy it at Boots, you can buy it, you know, all over Europe, you can buy CBD products. So the CBD market is, is, is fairly robust and growing, but, but CBD as a product in and of itself is, is effective to some extent, but nowhere near as some of the other cannabinoids that you have within the cannabis plant, medicinal cannabinoids. And so CBD, CBN, CBG mixed with, you know, certain dosages of THCV, THCA, THC, um, uh, really bring about the medicinal um, uh, uh, properties in, 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 in the plant. And so, so where we see there, we've, as I said, we, we're seeing the, the UK program starting to accelerate in terms of patient growth. And we're quite excited about that. It took a while, but it's now starting to accelerate. Um, Europe um, slowed down. I mean, Germany slowed down a little bit during COVID. But now as it's reopening, we fully expect that program to start accelerating as well. There's also a lot of talk in Germany right now about a, a path to adult use. With mm. Angela Merkel stepping down in September, there's quite a lot of debate within Germany as to whether or not they should move that market into an adult use market. And so we think so. I mean, Spain also just launched a, a study and a commission um, to study the international medical programs and find a structure for Spain. I mean, Spain is one of the largest cannabis, illicit cannabis users in, in their population in the, in the world. Um, and I mean, you just have to walk down, you know, the, the, the beach in, in, in Barcelona and, and that's all you smell is, is cannabis. So, so you know, it is, it's an obvious one for them. The other thing is you have to remember that, that it's, it's very um, uh, interesting that we're being sponsored by Prohibition Partners because 
Um, because if you look, remember prohibition in the United States, alcohol prohibition in the United States, the reason it was lifted when it was, was because of, you know, the Great Depression. And tax revenues were incredibly, incredibly important. Now, you have this massive illegal market that's run by criminal organizations all over Europe because of this, you know, very, very stupid, in my opinion, law of prohibition on cannabis. Um, and why not bring it out, regulate it, and tax it? It creates a massive tax base um, for the governments. And after the pandemic, as, you, as we all know, economies are struggling. Cannabis industry in the United States is number one hire right now of people, right? It's the fastest growing industry in the United States at the moment, and it hires more people than any other industry at the moment in the United States. I can tell you that Cureleaf in the last three years has gone from like 300 employees to 5,000 employees. And most of them have been hired in the last 12 months. So it's an incredible pace of, of hiring that's taking mm. place. And, and Europe has an unemployment. I mean, Spain has, a, particularly amongst its youth, that has like a 25% unemployment rate. I think it gets as high as 40% in certain regions. So it's if you allow the cannabis industry that has a natural customer base already that's using it to come out from, you know, and and, and become a, a legitimate open business, I think that you could, you know, solve two birds with one stone. One is it gets rid of the criminal organizations that are doing this. Two, it's going to employ the youth uh, in the industry because the youth loves this industry, I can tell you that. And three, it helps with the economic issues in the country with taxation. So it creates a whole new industry from a taxation perspective. So to me, it's obvious. I mean, in the United States, cannabis for medical reasons polls at 93%. The United States is maybe the most divided country in the world now. There's one issue that the country's united on. Really, it's just, it's funny, but it's cannabis. Every cannabis initiative is passed with a massive bipartisan vote in every single state. The only thing holding it back is the old, you know, war on drugs, which was misguided and funded by alcohol and and and, um, and pharmaceutical companies. Well, now alcohol is flipped. The alcohol industry is flipped because they're under threat. Every state in the United States where adult use cannabis has been legalized today, cannabis tax revenues are substantially higher than alcohol revenues, and alcohol use has substantially dropped in every one of those states. So. It's something that they realize now that the genie's out of the bottle in the U.S. They have to embrace because they want to get into the business. So now the, the alcohol companies are lobbying for the legalization on a federal level of cannabis. The same exact thing is going to happen in Europe, in my opinion. And eventually, as soon as synthetic cannabis comes around, you're going to see pharmaceutical com companies jump on, on, on the bandwagon as well because it's an incredibly healing plant um, from many perspectives. So I... I I don't. I think that the genie's out of the bottle, as they say. I think you can't turn this back now, and I think it's just a matter of getting over some of the stigmas and getting some of the politicians to stand up to big pharma and say, you know, we are going to legalize this. And I think that's the last impediment that's really there. And when you put it like that, you know, one could ask, why is it taking so long? But as you also mentioned, the, the reason is probably stigma. So if you go back to one of the examples you mentioned, I mean, so this conversation happening in Germany right now, I mean, in terms of timelines, how quickly do you think it will take for, for I mean, I'm assuming you think that Germany will one day uh, legalize adult use. When do you think that would be? I think that um, the elections in September, I think the debate starts soon after. I think you could probably get a law passed in 22. And then I think after they write the rules, it probably gets launched in 23. So I think realistically speaking, you could get adult use cannabis in Germany in, in 2023, uh, maybe towards the, the back end of it, but I think you could. Um, and if Germany goes, you know, the, there goes the rest of the union, in my opinion. I, but I think, you know, Spain is very seriously considering it. Um, France is considering it. France has got a medical program under testing. You know, we're involved in that medical program as we speak. Um, and so I think most of these countries, I mean, Israel probably would be adult use now. It has a very robust medical program. Um, it would be adult use if not for the fact that they can't form a government. Of course, the current um, you know, uh, issues plaguing Israel are, are going to obviously slow that process down because it's not a priority. I think also, Patricia, COVID slowed a lot of things down. Um, COVID slowed because regulators, I mean, let's be honest, these businesses are regulated by the departments of ministries of health in most countries. Um, mm -hmm. And 
those ministries have been, you know, backlogged with COVID issues. I mean, they can't even get in many of these countries, they can't even get um, vaccinated. So cannabis is definitely, you know, not at the top priority for them at the moment. But I do think that you'll find that that will change very, very quickly as we come out of this COVID situation. And I think you'll see an acceleration in Europe of uh, ministries of health looking at cannabis and starting to um, liberalize certain aspects of, of it around it. So I, I'm very, very optimistic, but it's not going to be fast. It's going to take a little bit of time because Europe is behind the United States on this. But if the United States, for instance, passes any kind of legalization legislation over the next two years, I think almost very quickly after that, we could see legislation in, uh, in Europe on that basis. Um, to kind of take a step back and talk a little bit about the, the, the whole industry. Um, so, I mean, currently, this business model, at least in the US, is, is quite rapidly shifting from medical to recreational. And so I wanted to ask you, how does the how does Curaleaf, but the whole industry, manage this this um, the overlap or the merger between medical and recreational? Because they're completely different things in a way, and you know, have different audiences and different markets. And you know, I think there is a if you look at more conservative conservative voices, there is a slight hesitancy towards medical cannabis, perhaps as well, because it is felt that this is something that is being lobbied um for to actually achieve uh recreational legalization and so how does an industry that kind of straddling both how, how do you manage that well i i think we have to deal with with first with the hypocrisy of all of this right the hypocrisy is there's over a hundred billion dollar illicit market in europe today so politicians in europe your populations are smoking a lot of cannabis and frankly they're buying it that's unregulated, it's unsafe, you, you don't know what's in the various products that are being made in basements, uh, and, and you're sponsoring criminal groups. So let's, let's be honest about what's actually happening today in Europe and the United States for that matter. At least in the United States, we're dealing with it by reducing the illicit market and increasing the legal regulated market through the programs that are there today. In Europe, however, it's at an early stage, but the fact is the illicit market is booming in Europe in every single country, um, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, everywhere, there's a lot of illicit cannabis. And so there, there's we have to deal with the hypocrisy from a political level. They know it's there. They're allowing it to happen. There's virtually no arrests taking place in the sector anymore because it's not accepted from the population. And so let's deal with that first. The second thing is, I think that the industry will be split into eventually into three categories. It's going to be there's going to be an adult use category, which will be regulated in terms of level of THC, et cetera, et cetera, right? Just like alcohol is. Um, then there will be a nutraceutical market, which will be something between the pharma market and the recreational market, and that's kind of like vitamins are, right? And and additives and things, dietary supplements and things like that. And then there will be a pharmaceutical market. The pharmaceutical market, at least in the U.S., pharmaceutical companies, Europe is changing a little bit on this front, but in the U.S., pharmaceutical companies largely work with synthetic products because they need to have a stable supply chain and they want to make sure biologicals, you know, a plant can grow depending on its climate differently every time it grows. Even with all the DNA modification and genetics that they've done, you could still get, and you could get bad weather. So you have a supply chain that's not stable. Whereas in mm -hmm. pharmaceutical, they need a very supply chain. That's why most pharmaceutical companies work with synthetic products. And there's a lot of money going into synthetic cannabis now in Europe and in the United States. As a matter of fact, maybe more in Europe for development of the pharmaceutical uh, levels, right, of pharmaceutical um, products. So I think that that's how it's going to look. And, and if you look at Cureleaf, Cureleaf really is working on wellness. So we're in the nutraceutical business in the U.S. and we're in the, and, and in the adult use market. We're not at the moment nor do I foresee us anytime soon getting into the pharma. Now we may be pushed into pharma in Europe and mm -hmm. we are looking potentially at making some acquisitions in that space. But at the moment, Cureleaf strategy is very much wellness, creams, nutraceutical products using cannabis and cannabis. I'm very sorry, I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I'm getting yeah. some threatening messages here from the moderator. We've run out of time, um, but I do hope that this is a conversation that we can, uh, that we can continue sure. some other time. And and uh, hopefully that more people can hear it as well. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. That was great, Patricia. Thank you. Hope to speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.